Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining. One of the final sessions, of course, at the World Economic Forum. We're headed towards the end, but it's an all-important session. We're talking about Africa's economic outlook this afternoon. My name is Julie Gishuru. I'm a TV host with Citizen TV in Kenya, an entrepreneur with Aramis Media Limited, and it's a pleasure to be with you today. Our focus um, this afternoon, and with the help of this esteemed panel, we're going to be looking into trends that will inform Africa's economic outlook for the next 12 months. So let me introduce our panel right next to me. Um, is Gozi Okonjo Iweala. She really doesn't need introduction, but she's the coordinated minister for the economy and the minister of finance in Nigeria. And right next to Ngozi, we have the governor of the Central Bank of Tanzania, Beno Ndulu. Seated next to Beno is Anders Borg, who's the Minister of Finance for Sweden. He's also a member of the Global Agenda Council on the Future of Government. Next to Borg, we have Lina Mohloklo, who is the governor and board chairman of the Bank of Botswana. And she's a member of the Global Agenda Council on the Future of universities. And last but certainly not least, we have Pravin Gordon, who is the Minister of Finance here in South Africa. Let's give them all, please, a big hand. Thank you. I should say this is the digital age and we are streaming live and so let's welcome our audiences as well across the globe. Thank you very much for joining us. We are tweeting with Africa economic outlook it is, so do tweet your thoughts and comments in as well. And so to start us off, because we are in the digital age, I'm going to use a question that came in from Paul Ajayi on Facebook. And he asks, is Africa ready for a changed, improved and enhanced economic outlook? And if yes, what's the first step? Ngozi. I think uh, it's not whether Africa is ready for a changed, improved, and enhanced economic outlook. I think Africa is already experiencing a changed, improved, and enhanced economic outlook. I think that we always say, uh, before we know where we're going, let's, let's look at where we came from. And it looks to me like maybe people are forgetting the doldrums of the 80s and 90s, when the continent was known as the failing continent when nothing was going right. There was no economic growth in, on the continent. Uh, uh, no stable macroeconomic policies. Um, you looked at every indicator and things were not right. We learned a lot from those lost decades and we, policymakers on the continent have corrected a lot of things and provided a platform that is now providing some growth now, steady growth for over a decade. And it's not just uh, a flash in the pan, as many people have been uh, looking to see whether this will fade away. It's been sustained, and even during these uncertain uh, global economic times, Africa has managed to sustain this growth. So I think the key question is twofold. One, how do we keep this growing and uh, step it up a bit more? But more importantly, how do we make sure that people are le not left out? that the growth does not come with increasing inequality, that we uh, you know, have growth that really creates jobs. Because we're facing on this continent severe challenge of inclusion. We are not creating enough jobs for our youth. We are also uh, don't have robust safety nets for those at the bottom end of the ladder who have been left behind. So how can we grow? We mustn't stop growing. But how can we share the proceeds so that our youth and our people feel that this growth really works for them? That, I think, is the key challenge um, that we have going towards the future. Well, Pravin, let me, let me come to you next with this. Do, do you agree that already we've achieved quite a bit of growth? I mean, certainly over the past decade, it's been a different story. But let's address the issues that Ngozi has raised. How do we keep it going? And what about inclusiveness? No, I, I agree with my colleague. Uh, what Africa has a valuable opportunity to do is not just keep the GDP number going between five and eight or nine. It's about the quality of, of, of that GDP growth, firstly. Secondly, uh, there's a very important opportunity both for Africa and the world for us to produce, if you like, a new model of growth, which, uh, as Ngozi says, is, is based on inclusivity. 
which is based on uh, raising the human potential of the African continent, uh, and above all, based on creating new economic institutions, both within countries and between countries. Given the fact that we are 54 uh, economies and countries on the African continent, the manner in which over the next probably five years, we build regional institutions that can give us higher levels of integration uh, across some of the countries, and where we learn to build synergies and complementarities between us uh, is going to be uh, a very useful challenge for us to actually uh, overcome. And then lastly, we also the continent that's got to provide answers to sustainability. Uh, we we uh, have 60% of arable land on this continent. We have huge natural resources. And uh, one of the challenges that most countries in Africa still need to overcome is firstly building a fiscal base uh, so that you have less dependence on customs duty, for example, uh, a wider tax base uh, in each of our countries. But linked to that is something that we speak about quietly, but we need to make a lot more noise about, which is the leakage of uh, money from the African continent, right. which, if it remains on this continent, will mean that we don't need aid from anyone, that we will have enough resources in this continent. And we have lots of investable capital uh, in this continent as well. And that's a challenge uh, for all of us from all parts of the globe uh, in, in order to realize some of the dreams that we have uh, for ourselves. Right, you know, the, the fear is, is, is an economic scramble for Africa that leaves the African, uh, indigenous Africans disenfranchised and something that we need to look at. And, and, and let me come to you, Benno, now on this issue. East Africa, newfound wealth, an immense amount of interest, just looking at the stability now that is starting to be achieved in Somalia. And of course, just this week, the, the, the conference on Somalia held in the UK, with the UK really looking to come in as, as, a, as a big investor and, and trading partner. Um, what are your thoughts on the next 12 months in terms of Africa's growth? Well, um, Africa, I think, has three key opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, one is certainly uh, based on its uh, natural uh, resource wealth. Um, and we know uh, countries that uh, were fortunate to start exploiting this before, um, they might have gone through experiences which were not very positive, but they have actually come back. Um, and they are uh, actually reorganizing how to make good use of proceeds from those natural mm. resources. And these are providing also lessons, I think, for the rest of us who are just about to embark on the same journey. Uh, and, you know, the advantage of late starters is certainly to learn and avoid mistakes. And I think uh, the region is well poised uh, to do that. Um, I think also uh, of very great importance, I, I believe uh, one of the key comparative advantage we have is the low labor costs and youthful population. Mm -hmm. uh, the geese of manufacturing, particularly labor intensive manufacturing, I think are flying west, westwards from uh, East Asia, and I believe they will land in Africa and stay there. <laughs> and provided we do skills, and we do skills well, we address costs of doing business, and certainly uh, tool ourselves on the innovation side. Okay, we'll come back to whether our, our governments are focusing, or our regions uh, are focusing on doing this. Um, Lina, let, let me come to you now. What are your thoughts? Of course, a very rich country, Botswana. What are you seeing happening, and what are your expectations over the next 12 months in terms of Africa's growth? One is filled with tremendous hope with respect to economic growth, uh, not just for Botswana, the sub-region, and not just for the continent. Uh, but um, let me just focus a little bit on one aspect. If anyone in this room did not gather support or, or strength from the fact that the entire continent was able to generate uh, 
what I would call impressive growth, even during the financial crisis, then, then, then we're not hopeful. Um, there is investor confidence, perception about Africa has completely changed for the better. And this is against uh, the background of uh, a whole lot of things, including economic growth that I just mentioned. There is also political stability, increasingly in the continent. There is a decrease in civil, in, in civil conflict. Um, if you, the observers have suggested that there's a significant increase to the tune of 60%. So to me, a combination of these factors should be able to give us confidence that um, we have to forge forward. Um, I don't want to um, leave unmentioned the fact that we have this abundant discovery of natural resources, not just in East Africa, but also in, in, in Mozambique. Mm -hmm. um, there's absolutely no doubt that this will flow outside the borders of these countries to an extent where it will reignite economic growth in the entire continent, certainly in the sub-region. And uh, exciting things are happening in the north as well. So to me, I have tremendous hope. There are all sorts of issues that we're grappling with, including some of the, the factors that Ngozi mentioned earlier. And I have no doubt in my mind that, as we have mentioned earlier, it will be quality growth and inclusive growth. Inclusive in this particular case, I would like to single out women. If you can include women in all aspects that lead to tremendous economic growth, it will triple to double-digit growth, even in areas where we are used to only single-digit growth. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Lena. Let me come to you now, Anders. And um, next 12 months, um, it's, it seems to be a very exciting time for the continent. What are you seeing from your perspective from outside of Africa? But also, what lessons do you think Africa can learn, whether positive or negative, from the European experience? Well, after the very nice dinner yesterday, I made one reflection. And there is a huge difference between Africa and Europe. Uh, at all the head tables, uh, yesterday there were presidents and leaders and so forth. Uh, but David Lipton, the deputy managing director of the IMF, was actually missing. Uh, if this would have been a dinner in Europe, uh, the head of the managing director or the deputy managing director of IMF would be sitting next to the president or maybe between the presidents of two countries. And he, she, he or she, David or, or Christine, would have known all of these uh, leaders uh, intimately. Mm -hmm. Uh, for the wrong reasons, it, because we are today the crisis zone in, in, in the world economy. 60% of, of the loan from IMF is, is going to Europe. In Africa, IMF is sitting somewhere in the back for good reasons. The countries are doing well. There is a high degree of macroeconomic stability. Uh, debt levels of, of the public sector is below 40%, 3% deficits. Inflation has come down. East Africa has gone from very high inflation down to, to more stable and, and and reasonable rates. So I don't want to say that the message is that we shouldn't listen to the IMF, because I think <laughs> given that the world will be in a difficult place for the next 12 months, Europe will not sort out this problem. Europe will be particularly in, in, in the southern part a low growth zone. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we shouldn't expect high growth from, from uh, the southern part of the euro area for quite some time. ECB is actually having a percentage point as their pot potential growth. So I think we should realize this. And as good as the prospects are for Africa, one should be realizing that the imbalances are dangerous. And I, I think the fund was actually right when they, in their world economic outlook, were arguing for rebuilding buffers. Uh, the, the world is a tough place. I mean, financial markets are not always nice. So uh, Africa has done very well in terms of macroeconomic stability, but keep that stability going. And on the other side of the argument, I agree with, with Praven and, and, and the rest on, on, on the basic outlook. Uh, I think 6 7% or even 8% growth for Africa is probably the best forecast for maybe on at least the next 5 to 10 year period. So um, I think one should have a very optimistic baseline scenario. Optimism is great. Before I move away from you, Anders, what, how would you comment, um, you know, what would you say on the issue of, of, of those who are concerned that there's, there's a lot of investment inflows into the continent and possibly not enough policy or regulation around some of this. What, what would your comment be on this? Well, I've, I've met so many experts on Africa saying that the countries now are, are using kind of an Asian strategy for, for growth. And I, I must say that I, I see lack of an Asian strategy here. Uh, 
one part of the, the, the Chinese miracle has been that two-thirds of the private sector job that has come is foreign direct investment. That is actually producing goods that is going to be exported out of China into Europe. China is today producing half of all manufacturing goods. So a growth strategy where one is ex exporting to Europe and to the US and producing in Africa, based on foreign direct investment, not because it's so good in itself, but rather because it brings technology, it brings um, production capacity, and it also brings market access back to the home countries. So companies like H&M, IKEA, and to take the Swedish ones, but you could also use other European companies, they should, should come here and start to produce. Light manufacturing is a key part of an Asian growth strategy. And not only talking about coming to Nigeria and produce for the Nigerian market, but rather come to, to Tanzania or, or Ethiopia or South Africa to produce for the Swedish market or for the, for the European markets. Okay, Ngozi, your thoughts on this? Yes, well, I hope they'll come to Nigeria and produce for the Swedish market as well. But, <laughs> <clears throat> Anders, I wanted to say something uh, a little bit different. Yes, I think it is good to welcome the foreign direct investment and all it brings. And we certainly do that, and we're seeing the signs of confidence. But I think that there's a new phenomenon that we're talking about in Africa. And that is one, we've seen that emerging markets companies are really the biggest investors in Africa. But now we're seeing Africa investing in Africa. And that is a new phenomenon which we should thoroughly encourage. And uh, because, as Praveen said, we've got investable resources on this continent, uh, you know, and we just have not been so good at mobilizing it. Uh, we're seeing South African companies, the largest investors in our economy are probably the South Africans. And they're making very good returns on that investment, if I may say so. The MTNs, you know, they have seen explosive growth in, in mobile phones and are making uh, substantial profits. And we're, ha we're glad because they're also creating jobs. We've seen, uh, uh, you know, ShopRite game. We've seen, I can keep on naming the companies across the board. But we also see Nigerian companies going Probably the biggest cement magnet on the continent, Dangote, is now in 33 countries on mm -hmm. the continent and has just invested $3 billion or more. And it's keeping going. He's investing even in South Africa. We've seen our banks move across the continent from West to East Africa. And uh, our, our investors are also desirous. So let us look at this phenomenon. I know we focus on FDI all the time. You know, mm -hmm. but how about, you know, AIA? <laughs> AIA, Africa investing in Africa. Pravin, your yes. thoughts on this? And of course, you know, the other question for you, how do you think increased trade and investment with respect to the BRICS economies is going to impact on Africa for the next 12 months? You know, the, the FDI numbers look good, but I think what we also got to acknowledge is that there, much of those numbers are going into the resource sector. So part of the challenge, not just for the next year, but for the next probably five years, is, is how we lay the basis for uh, greater diversification uh, within the African economy. Uh, and secondly, it's linked to, if you want to increase intra-African trade, as some people said in an earlier session, well, each of us has got to produce something which is going to be tradable uh, and which other countries want to trade uh, in one way or the other. So the question is, where's our comparative advantages? What are we good at producing? Uh, and are we going to be able to produce the right quality and quantity and the right, at the right kind of cost? Mm -hmm. And I think uh, African entrepreneurs are beginning to look at uh, those sorts of questions. And of course, H&M uh, and IKEA and so on are welcome to join that uh, band of people who, who will increase uh, uh, industrialization, who will increase the services industry, which we have a lot to offer there as well. Uh, I've met people over the last two days who are interested in bringing research and development uh, uh, investments into the African continent, which I think for the next 10, 15 years is a very important uh, element to attract as well, because it's actually crucial uh, to uh, Africa's future development. And on the BRICS side, uh, there's some interesting trade uh, shifts that are taking place. 50% of global trade today is South-South trade. Uh, a couple of years ago, that used to be North North trade. Mm -hmm. And so they, they are what are commonly being called mega trends that are actually emerging, both on the continent and off the continent, that have a significant meaning uh, for us as well. 
secondly, uh, when the BRICS summit took place in, in Durban, uh, one of the things that President Zuma ensured happened is a three to four hour dialogue between about 15 uh, African leaders representing different regions on the continent and uh, the BRICS leaders that were here so that they could have an exchange on these questions as well and uh, ensure that there's a dialogue between BRICS leaders on the one hand and African leaders on the other hand uh, around what, what has BRICS got to offer and what has Africa got to offer. Uh, amongst the bigger FDI uh, uh, flows into Africa certainly flows from the BRICS countries as, as well. Mm -hmm. and, and given uh, the picture that Anders is painting about the European environment, he's talking about one year, some in his neighborhood are saying that probably for the next five years uh, you're going to have less than 1% growth in what is traditionally our market uh, as, the, as the African continent. So the time has certainly come, as, as Ngozi is pointing out, for Africa to start talking about what it's going to do for itself, how is it going to build its internal capacity to trade with itself, how is it going to increase the incomes of the billion people on the African continent so that they become effectively a billion consumers, of African goods produced on African soil with partners from, uh, from elsewhere. And certainly, uh, with the rising confidence that we see in Africa, we need to be able to negotiate better terms of trade uh, with, the, with the other BRICS partners in the rest of the world as well, so that uh, Africans uh, benefit uh, from, from the dynamics that are unfolding at the moment as well. So overall, I think there's a very optimistic picture uh, that we can look forward to but we won't be able to capitalize on that picture by folding our arms. There's a lot of hard work to do on the continent in terms of building skills, improving our education system, improving uh, the living standards of our people, and ensuring that uh, real inclusivity does operate on the African continent. And Africa has to put its, its money where its mouth is, is basically what we're saying. Invest in yourself, AIA. -A -A. Uh, Lena, let me come to you now. So lots of optimism expressed. What do you think, though, are the greatest challenges? The greatest challenges, uh, one of them is um, that we have to ensure a development of commitment to productivity and competitiveness. There's absolutely no question about it. I, I, I can tell you that in Botswana, one of our major problems is, you know, committing to work ethics that would enable us to reach from point one to point ten, uh, because you, you you have to leapfrog uh, because others have forged ahead. But let, let me just comment on the point that Ngozi made. I think she downplayed the role of Nigeria in IAI. There are Nigerian <laughs> banks, and I, I know it was deliberate that she did that. <laughs> Um, it's, 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 it's very, it's, it, 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 it tends to make headlines while multinationals um, invest in our continent. But when we invest in our own continent, no headlines are made. The, the, the financial services from South Africa, for instance, I can tell you that not only have they got a foothold in Botswana, they've been able to take the, 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 the lion's share of the market, which was initially occupied by British banks. And I'm excited about that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why we don't you know, sing and dance about it. Uh, uh, just, just because they are next door neighbors, we think that they can simply just walk across and take the market share. It's, Liter it's... Literally next door neighbors. <laughs> 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 That's right. So, so I thought I should just uh, comment Mention on that. that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the challenge, of course, is uh, with respect to IAI. AIA. IAA. A I A. <laughs> it's intra Africa investment. Okay. I -A -I. I -A -I. That's right. Okay. okay. So with respect to that, the challenge is that as we invest in each other's economies, we have to remember that we are going to have to pull resources in order to direct these resources towards infrastructure building, to enable mo mobility of labor, to mo uh, mobility of goods. And I'm quite excited about it because eventually it's not just going to be moving across borders. We will re remove these borders because they can actually um, uh, retard trade amongst and between countries. Right. I think uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta of Kenya speaking earlier at the panel uh, plenary session seemed very excited about the idea of removing these borders and, and the union, the possibility of at least a regional union. Well, tell um, me as a friend in Botswana then. 
<laughs> well, let's move on. Benno, just looking at the impact, for instance, of South African investments across the continent, Nigerian investments, we've just been talking about them across the continent. What are you noting in Tanzania? And um, also, moving on from that, what do you think are the key sectors that you will be keeping an eye on over the next 12 months? Yeah, in Tanzania, in fact, between uh, 2007 and 2009, the largest investor coming from outside of Tanzania actually was Kenya. Uh, it has been for many yes. years. <laughs> uh, and, you know, mostly, mostly it has been in services. Um, so you would see financial services, uh, communication services, uh, but increasingly now, I think uh, also into real production. Uh, it was mentioned, for example, uh, for the cement, Dangote now also has just, uh, is just starting uh, a huge cement factory in, uh, in Tanzania. Um, and, of course, it's breweries. Uh, this, this has been uh, something that uh, uh, has always crossed borders. Uh, so there is a lot more that has been going on um, in this uh, than uh, we had acknowledged before, and I think it is proper to really pay attention to that. Uh, it means also, though, uh, that uh, we need to start working seriously on barriers to that movement of uh, capital across our countries. Um, I know in East Africa, uh, we, if uh, there has been a bit of uh, preferential sort of treatment now within the region, even before uh, opening completely all doors uh, to outside. Um, but I think we need to do more in terms of capital controls, uh, the residual ones that are there. Um, we need to do more in terms of uh, um, investing in uh, connectivity so that, um, you know, uh, the region as a whole can really be the basis of uh, uh, flow uh, of most of the goods without uh, too many constraints, and it facilitates. Uh, once you know that you can invest in Tanzania and serve uh, five countries, uh, and easily so, um, it also, uh, I think, uh, promotes this. So I think it is um, a trend that is ex extremely important and positive, and if we can harness you know, the vast amount of idle savings and liquidity in our banks, mm -hmm. really to start moving more into uh, uh, investment in the region, I think that would be a, a very big uh, uh, and positive trend. Okay. Um, each of you, three sectors, please, that excite you the most over the next 12 months. Maybe I'll start here with Gozi and go all the way down. <laughs> um, before I come in, could I just okay, pick please. up on a good point that Anders made? Certainly. Which I think we shouldn't forget. You know, I listen to us. I'm an eternal optimist. I, we all sound very optimistic. But he made an important point about the vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. You know, we are not, our economies are not diversified enough, uh, many of us. And I think that's a vulnerability. So I just wanted to say that this issue of building buffers, and I think most of, the, of us are aware of it. The biggest buffer of all is to diversify the economy. We have a big opportunity in Nigeria because we actually have tremendous potential in agriculture, which we neglected for de decades. And now we have a terrific plan to do that and create the jobs needed. Uh, we need to look at other sectors within our economies to buffer us. And also our fiscal policies need to be strong. Uh, because, you know, when you depend on a few commodities, then it becomes a problem. So I just wanted to say that much as we are optimistic, we should also recognize our vulnerabilities and make plans now to, to, take, address, to address those. But now, so just before you start, I see Anders' hand also yeah. going up, and I was going to come to him. Um, and we'll come back to those three sectors from, from each of you. But Anders, uh, you may give us your comment, but also as you do that, um, we're talking about IAI slash AIA, uh, whichever way you look at it. Um, you know, all this optimism about Africa investing in Africa, what then happens? What do you see happening over the next year with respect to Africa's trading relations with uh, Europe and the US, for instance? Well, I, I strongly agree with what Ngozi said here. And uh, I think it actually also goes back to the issue of investments, because 
Um, if one has uh, too much investment, that means normally a current account deficit, that you're basically importing capital, which is good. I mean, a, a country with a low capital stock should import uh, uh, capital. But it's also dangerous. We know that the Asian countries, our own country, my own country, Sweden, uh, when current account deficits build, you get vulnerability. So what Ngozi was saying about savings is very, very important. Mm -hmm. Na uh, higher national savings that is financing part of the, the capital stock building is an integrated part of also a stability, st stable development. Because if you get um, too much foreign capital, you might get very hot capital. Mm -hmm. And then you have some crash in the stock market in Asia or some asset price bubble in the US going off, and all of, the, all of a sudden all of the, these assets are running away. So management of the balance of payment, I think, is, is very, very important, and also uh, building up, obviously, through, through the, the, the national savings, the, the basis for investments. Okay. Um, Julie, can yes, I ask please, the fact please. that, okay, I am for intra-Africa investment, mm -hmm. but the fact of the matter is it's, it's going to take us some time for us to loosen trade ties with North America and Europe. Europe continues to be the main dominant destination for Africa's exports. So as a, we, we, we will be in the process of diversifying export destinations. I don't think anybody would, should, 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 should think that overnight we would be able to stop the trade with, that Africa currently has with the Western countries. Okay, so you, you see the next year being the same, that the re ties will remain strong um, over the year to come. Let's go now to sectors, and this time I'll start on that end. Pravin, three of the sectors just, just you're to keeping build, an eye just on. Just to build firstly on, on what some of the colleagues were saying. <laughs> I think one, 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 and I'll come to the three very quickly. Okay. Uh, I, I think the warnings are very useful. Conf Self-confidence or extra confidence shouldn't lead to hubris. Yeah. Where we, where we forget that we're actually going to be living in a risky world for a long time to come, mm -hmm. just to reinforce that point. Mm -hmm. The three, three sectors, Thank there's a lot you. of talk <laughs> at WEF about uh, infrastructure in all its uh, many dimensions, and I think the, the, the thing to watch over the next 12 months is can we produce a list of bankable projects, can we get an implementation machinery agreed upon, and can we have one project for, uh, for the, each of the five regions in Africa which everybody can focus on and say we've begun the delivery process. The second is similarly in respect of uh, industry. Uh, are we establishing new uh, production capabilities? Are we getting a better understanding of what each of us is going to produce in a complementary way rather than overlapping and duplicating and replicating what others are doing? Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, there's only so much of cement that you can make and use. You know, if all of us are focusing on cement, we're going to be in trouble. And the third uh, is, is not an uh, economic sector, but it's uh, the degree of political decisiveness that we're going to demonstrate as a continent and as regions in order to create the conditions for some of the things that we are talking about to actually become reality rather than just remain talk. Thank you so much. Lena, your three? The three things. Mm -hmm. Well, for me, it's natural resource extraction. It will continue to be the key success factor for the continent. There's no question about it. Um, I can belabor the point about new findings in East Africa as well as Mozambique, if I were to just to mention the ones that are within reach of Botswana. Uh, and of course, the next one is agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, it also will continue to, to, to be the dominant uh, mm. sector on which we will, we will have. But allocation of land with respect to commercial and traditional farming, we have to ensure that tensions are, are ameliorated um, because um, they can stand in the way of progress. Mm -hmm. um, the third um, sector that I'm excited about is services, um, transport and communications, financial services. Um, they will continue to uh, ensure that um, uh, Africa um, makes inroads in the direction of uh, improved economic growth as we move forward. And they will also underpin the um, activity that we have now seen with respect to IAI. I have to say it slowly because <laughs> this is, it's an acronym that you say with your mouth open until you finish it. So that's, that's, that's my three areas, um, sectors that I believe will make a contribution 
um, to uh, impressive economic Th growth. Thank you. Anders, what are you keeping an eye on? What three sectors? Mm -hmm. uh, basically, I agree with, with uh, the points made by, by both uh, 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 of the previous speaker. I, I think they basically got it right. Uh, I would only mention, for example, electricity cross-border, because I think mm. uh, big in electricity investments are transformatory, not only in terms of investment, but also in regulatory structure. Uh, I run the Swedish uh, electricity company Vattenfall, uh, who are producing uh, some 50 terawatts of, of hydro energy uh, and uh, nuclear energy. The problem with, nu with, with energy investments is that you basically pay a lot, and then you have a low marginal cost and a huge uh, monopoly profit running out of that, because the market marginal cost then is normally quite higher than it is for hydro or for, for long-term production in, for example, nuclear. That means that you're vulnerable for political risks. Can I do this big uh, uh, five, six billion dollar investment in, in a plant and then live with it for 20 or 30, 40 years without seeing political risks? So I think there are some good logic why this could be a combination between different states, maybe two or three different mm -hmm. states coming together and make the investment together with the international community and thereby also creating credibility for the political risk that yes, this is a viable investment, it has to be ongoing for quite some time and therefore becomes a, a, a very, it, it doesn't have to be high return, it's, it's not 20% return on, on five years, it might be five years for 20 or 30 years, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, you get the political guarantees by, by, by also having its transformatory effect between the countries. So, so that could be a, one thing to think about. Okay, something to keep an eye on. Benno, your thoughts? Yeah, I agree on uh, agriculture, so I will not um, uh, belabor the point. Mm -hmm. But there are two sectors that I really think uh, will make a huge, continue to make a huge difference. One is um, financial services. Mm -hmm. and, and there really is uh, uh, the use of mobile telephony platform uh, for purposes of uh, rolling out uh, financial access. Um, also, a whole range of new products now are being offered uh, using that platform. Uh, whether you, you hear about M-Pesa, uh, you hear about a whole range of other innovations around uh, that platform, it's going to make a big difference as far as financial inclusion is concerned. Second, I, uh, I really think on the, um, the IT investments, um, which are going to make, I think, a big difference in terms of productivity um, uh, um, growth in our countries, um, mostly organizational, mostly logistical, which is an element that I think has been missing. You can, you can do the infrastructure but if we don't invest in logistic um, uh, capacity, you don't get goods from where they're produced to where actually they should be going. And that's, logistics is what made Dubai, Dubai, and I think we should also be keeping an eye on that. Okay, thank you so much. Ngozi, your three? Yeah, I just uh, wanted to say that I agree with, uh, um, with I think it's Anders and, and um, well, with all the speakers, actually, on two areas as enablers. Mm -hmm. Power, we have to keep an eye on that. We have, need to generate mm -hmm. enough to make things happen on this continent in manufacturing and, in fact, all sectors and for our households and financial services. I was going to talk of that as an enabler. Just yesterday, we had an exciting launch with MasterCard mm -hmm. uh, of Nigeria. We're going to do a pilot of 13 million identity cards with a MasterCard plat electronic platform on that, which will enable us to do, uh, be financially inclusive. People will have a payments platform for government, some government payments, etc. So this is really going to change the way things are being done. So those are enablers. For me, with some of these enablers in infrastructure, power, and financial services, I think there are three sectors that excite me. One has been mentioned by almost everybody, which is agriculture. I really think that Africa would come out blazing in that sector because we've just got such an advantage and we see investors coming in. But let me mention, you know, two others that may be not really typical. Mm -hmm. I'm a strong believer in what we call the creative industries. 
And that is maybe because my country has the third largest film industry in the world. Some, say, some say it's now the second or after. the second largest. Yes, yeah. That it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> and it's creating so many jobs. It's created a million indirect jobs, 200,000 jobs, $250 million mm -hmm. in value. Wow. And we just met with the industry, not to interfere with them, God forbid, because we were not responsible for their success. So at least do no harm, you know? But just to understand where can government help with intellectual property, mm. with distribution, so that we can enhance. And I see this creating many, many jobs. And since Nigeria is the largest country, if we don't solve our jobs problem, then the numbers on the continent will still look bad. So I'm very excited. And we have so much talent across the continent on these issues. In every African country, it's amazing when you go, the talent you see, the culture you see. And I just feel like we're not harnessing that enough. I see movement there. I also see housing. You know, we're not talking mm. enough. I mean, other countries, do, do you know, every month the US has the case Shiller index. They monitor what happens in the housing sector like a hawk, because they see that as a driver of economic growth. Why is that? Because it's linked to so many things. You know, once you get your housing going, you get, get construction, you get carpenters, welders, painters, decorators. Mm -hmm. However, we have to look at it sensibly. We certainly don't want to go and create a bubble and repeat what happened in the US and even Malaysia in the 1997 crisis, which their, their financial crisis was actually in, uh, from the housing sector. But I see it, look, in my country, we need two million units every year. We have a 70 million unit deficit. And we, we have very few mortgages. So there's a whole opportunity there and across the continent to, to make this a driver of jobs, whilst at the same time fulfilling a social Absolutely. need. Absolutely, giving you people know. a dignified exactly. life. Everybody well. wants a roof over their head, mm -hmm. and we have to give them the means to do that. Thank you. Um, at this point, I'm going to open it to the floor and take a few questions. If you put your hand up, give us your name, tell us where your, your organization, and uh, Put your question to the panel, please. Can we have the mic with the lady in the gray jacket? Thank you. Hello, my name is Lola, mm -hmm. and um, I'm from the Global Shapers Hub in Lagos. And I was really excited to hear about the three um, areas um, that you are all excited about. But I didn't hear anything at all about ICT infrastructure. And I just wanted to know what role you think that you know, governments can play in terms of I ICT infrastructure, access to internet, because there's a lot of growth that ha anchors on that. Thank you so much. The gentleman over here in the beige shirt jacket, please. Can we have the mic here at the front? Um, do we have some more mics? No? Yes? OK, could you give it to the gentleman right there? Yes, his hand is up. Thank you. So first with you, go ahead, please. Yeah. My name is Jafet Omojo. I'm from you. the Abuja Hub of the Global Shippers. Um, there was an incentive to build Africa's infrastructure by the colonial masters, which was to transport Africa's goods via the borders. So what are we thinking about? Because if we are going to have intra-African trade, we need to build infrastructure for that. Is there any concerted effort or any strategy amongst the government and the corporations to actually build Africa for this purpose? Because we have to move from the 12% um, trade amongst Africa to say even 60% as is it in, in Europe and other parts of the world. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for that. The gentleman at the back, and this mic can go to the gentleman on the front row, and then the man, at, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, my name is Gerald Mahinda from Diageo. Um, I'd like to get a comment from Nkosi and, 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 and Pravin, uh, the finance ministers. Um, Energy is one of the biggest enabler to, for development, whether it's China, uh, Latin America, even in the US. And we're talking about infrastructure and cross-border and interdependency. So I'd like to get your views because I've read a lot about the potential of the hydropower in the DRC. Um, it's in a lot of government session papers. What's stopping a project like that going ahead? Because that will be a key enabler for opening up development in Africa. Thank you so much for that. Just one moment, we'll come back to you. I see the gentleman over there at the back as well. Uh, and we will come to these two as well. Thank you. So let, let, let's just quickly take uh, the, the questions that we have. Who wants to address the IT, ICT infrastructure issue? What role can and should governments be playing? Benno, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, we, 
we, we definitely have an example in Tanzania. We have just invested in uh, uh, 10,000 kilometers of uh, fiber uh, optic network, which not only connects the country, but also connects with all our five neighbors. Um, and this is uh, including the landlocked countries of uh, uh, Rwanda, Burundi, uh, um, Zambia, uh, and Malawi. And the, the thing which uh, the government has done is really just to invest in that um, uh, laying out of the physical infrastructure and then open uh, to uh, various service providers to make good use of, uh, of that. Yes, because it's, uh, it's so expensive sometimes to do it purely on a private sector basis that uh, this is one thing that governments can definitely uh, enable. Play a role, and I think many of them are. Uh, Gosi, you wanted to come in here as well? Oh, just a quick comment. Mm -hmm. I wanted to say that one of the, we have a, a very exciting uh, ICE Minister for Information and Communications Technology. And, uh, you know, with the explosion in mobile phones, we're looking at a whole range of things. But one is the idea of just exciting our young people by making more information available, uh, you know, which can lead them to create all sorts of apps that would really help us with our work. So, for instance, she's going to start a competition, you know, who can create apps from the budget. Mm -hmm. We have people putting out the budget. Already some people are doing it putting out government uh, revenues and payments, putting out all sorts of information and then saying, okay, how can we make use of this in various ways, even for holding government accountable? So applications of ICT and being, enabling them just by pro pro providing the information is one thing. We also have a small, priv uh, a small um, a fund uh, that has been created to invest and encourage small ICT, $25 million only she started, but to encourage people, small entrepreneurs, uh, to, to uh, invest. It, it's a huge growth area. I, I think even one of our social innovators here at, at the WEF is involved in education content on apps and, and uh, you know, delivered to, to children. So mm -hmm. it, fascinating area. I'm going to move to the next issue. Um, we talked about the regional infrastructure issue and why aren't we doing more? I, I can tell you a lot's been done in East Africa with respect to our roads and our, our transport networks. You can look into that. But I want to put this to the panel. Um, how much more should we be doing to ensure our regional infrastructure works? And also, I think this is in connect, interconnected with a question from uh, Gerald Mahinda, which was uh, in relation to the hydropower that we could uh, derive from our amazing uh, African nation, DRC. Why are we sitting back? Who, who wants to jump in here? Well, uh, from a South African point of view, but also uh, more generally, I think the energy issue is a key issue for all of us in Africa. Secondly, it shouldn't just be country-based systems. We've also got to look for, ultimately, uh, a continent-wide grid, uh, or at least uh, substantial regional grids. On the Inga project, there's been negotiations and discussions going on for some time. Mm -hmm. uh, more recently, the South African government has signed uh, an MOU uh, with the DRC government, laying the basis for some movement on this particular front. Uh, and I think uh, we've got to settle the Great Lakes area in a way in which we can actually get progress. Uh, and lots of investors have actually uh, expressed interest in, in uh, uh, coming in to provide the funds for what can turn out to be quite a turning point in the energy story uh, of, of the African yeah. continent. On the infrastructure one, uh, I mean, at this WEF alone, there's been lots of discussions. There's a public-private partnership that over the last year with WEF has uh, built on the NEPAD plans that we have for the continent. Uh, we're now at a stage where there are bankable projects available. There's ideas about how the private sector can participate. Uh, the only question now is to get an implementation machinery going, as I pointed out earlier. And I think we, uh, we are very close to that. Uh, certainly, if, again, from a South African point of view, there's a fair number of uh, investments that take place from the Southern African uh, Development Bank in uh, regional infrastructure. Uh, and if you look at the tripartite uh, free trade area, uh, that is being uh, negotiated at the moment, 
if we can pull that off here, if West Africa can do similar things as well, I think we we, we establishing uh, trade blocks regionally, which need to be supported by infrastructure, road, rail, etc. Lots of plans are on the table. Uh, the money is beginning to come on the table. We've got to create uh, a little bit more dynamism in, in terms of actually on the delivery side. Uh, in terms of free movement, there's some good experiments with one-stop border posts that ease the flow of goods. Uh, but as long as customs duty, as I said earlier on, remains a key income, I don't think trade is going to move too freely because there's all sorts of incentives to uh, not allow things to move too freely uh, at, at the border post. So we've got to solve uh, some of those conundrums. Thank you so much. Lena, your thoughts? On yeah, that? I mean, I, I, I think everybody knows that um, with respect to ICT and infrastructure, um, the revolution, telecommunications revolution has, has demonstrated, certainly with respect to Kenya's M-Pesa, uh, that um, it can effectively um, support the trickle down to um, low-income and rural dwellers. Uh, that is not just um, the effect of, of, of governments investing in ICT and telecommunications. It's also a way of inclusive growth. Some of the people who are not able to access um, mm. uh, some, some, some services which are offered by the center are able to sit back in wherever they are, in, 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 even in remotest areas of, 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 of countries and still be able to, 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 to communicate. Um, I mean, there is very little I could add with respect to infrastructure. The minister has um, um, covered all issues, but I couldn't agree more that if we were to continue to want to benefit, I'm, I'm speaking in, in this respect with respect to the Southern African Customs Union. If countries are, uh, that are members are going to continue to rely on resources from SACU, uh, we are going to continue to slow down movements of goods and services across borders. So we have to find a way of diversifying and uh, generating income from elsewhere uh, because we want infrastructure to be able to facilitate. What's the point putting, um, you know, great infrastructure between countries if it's not meant to facilitate not just movements of people but also movements of goods? Mm -hmm. I just uh, like in speed. But you're right, I couldn't agree more. Africa is lagging behind with respect to infrastructure. How it, uh, but, you know, sometimes I don't lose hope when I have to drive in the streets of New York City and there are potholes all over the place, all the way from the airport to, 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 to your destination downtown. But I'm not suggesting that we should deteriorate to that extent. I think once we have it, we should also be in a, in a, in a, in a situation that will enable us to maintain it. Thank you. Thank you, Lena Bog. Please come in. Well, yeah. I think the gentleman's question here is, is a, a very good uh, question because it gives us also a perspective. Um, I, was, I was on a panel uh, today on uh, East Africa in uh, Africa in 2063, and uh, I did some calculations uh, early in the morning on uh, what would happen with trade if we just took East Africa and turned it into the Nordic countries in 2063. If you take Kenya as a starting point, I would guess that they would trade, their export to Tanzania should be close to 10% of GDP. Their export um, uh, to Ethiopia should probably be something like 10% of uh, GDP. Somalia, maybe 6, 7. Uh, Uganda, maybe around 6. Maybe South Africa, another 5. Maybe Egypt, 5. That would be 50% of GDP in intra-regional trade in that region, mm -hmm. which is normal for a, a, a developed uh, a country which we are hoping that Kenya will be in, in 2063. This means in terms of infrastructure, an enormous need for roads and easy access and, and, and inter-regional trade, which will be the ones that is actually creating the best growth, not the extractive growth, but rather the creative and integrating growth. So I, I think there is a, a huge need for for connecting the countries with, with infrastructure also from, from that perspective. I, I do have to say, with respect to um, the whole 2063 conversation on social media, a lot of young people are balking at that and they're saying 2063, I'm like, you know, at least you might be alive. Some of us won't be here. Uh, but there's lots of concern about how long it seems to take. Of course, good things take time, but I, I will bring it to you. What are the low hanging fruits before we close? And how long do you think we can take to get to a place where we feel we can call ourselves a developed uh, region. Um, so we'll come to that, but we do have a few more questions. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. 
My name is Peter Draper. I'm the Vice Chair of the Forum's Trade Council and also a South African. So in the spirit of IAT, or Intra-Africa Trade, I wanted to throw in something slightly left field, perhaps. That has to do with the fact that whilst we all support regional integration processes, we all know that it's very difficult to deliver in practice. And so maybe one way to re-energize the process is to think about key bilateral relationships. And I particularly have in mind South Africa and Nigeria. And I'm wondering, is it possible, is it conceivable to think about a bilateral free trade agreement between the two countries? They, they could then start to re-energize regional discussions in interesting and perhaps unpredictable ways. Thank you for that. Thank you. The gentleman at the back, please. A question for Mr. Nadulu. Uh, my name is Adam Green from This Is Africa. I wondered if the oil and gas fines in East Africa, how that was affecting conversations about a common currency whether it was going to make it more difficult. Thank you very much. The lady here at the front. Uh, my name is Saran Kaba Jones. I run an NGO focused on delivering access to clean water in Liberia. Um, my question is, we can't talk about Africa's economic outlook without talking about the continent's political landscape. How can we ensure stable political transitions and also overcome religious and ethnic divisions, because without stability in regions or sub-regions, economies can't grow and thrive. Thank you for that. Um, yes, so the gentleman over here, please, and then the one at the back. Thank you. I am Davide Markovic from Moete Chandon and Hennessy. We sell uh, happiness in the form <laughs> of champagne and uh, Hennessy. Uh, <laughs> During these two days, of course, I heard a lot about the priority in, in uh, most of uh, the African com uh, countries uh, in infrastructure, agriculture, etc. But I, I, I felt a big missing of one big industry uh, that can be uh, very prospective in, in, in Africa, which is tourism. Mm -hmm. You have sun, you have <laughs> very nice places, very nice beaches, and of course, you can export uh, that for the Sweden. I think in, in winter they need sun. They can come to, to take it in Africa. So uh, uh, probably it is one industry that Africa should uh, think, or at least some of uh, the African country can think for the future. Thank you so much, gentlemen over there. And the other mic can make its way here, please. We will only be able to take two more, so I'll take a lady on this end and a lady on that end, and then we'll have to... Thank you very much. My story. name is Wadi Ait Hamza. I'm a global shaper from the Rabat Hub in Morocco. And I would like to take the example of, of, of my region, the Maghreb. When we talk about the integration, if I give you the number, I, I'm, I'm sure you'll be scared. It represents 1.3% 1, 1. of all the, the external, uh, external growth uh, that is those countries are exporting. So it's really a shame. But my question to you is, uh, uh, will, be, uh, will be this one. Is it in our region the economy who drives the politics, or is the politics who's driving the economy? Mm, thank you for that. Please, go ahead. Um, my name is Dr. Ola Orokunrin, and I currently run an air ambulance service in Nigeria. And part of our work is to transfer sick patients from the African region to um, places in Europe um, for complex medical <coughs> procedures. So my question to the board is, nobody actually mentioned healthcare, and I think healthcare is, has such huge potential. The amount of money that goes from African countries to places like India on healthcare and medical tourism is very huge. So I'm wondering what the, health, um, what the panel thinks about investing um, in healthcare for Africa and I need to start thinking how soon, depending on the panel's answers, our ambulance will be um, an ambulance that transfers people for, from Europe and the Western world to Africa for complex medical <laughs> Thank procedures. You. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. A lady on that end, please. Um, good afternoon. My name is Lorato, and I'm a global shaper from the Botswana Hub. My question is from Mamohotlo. I just wanted to know, what more do you think in agriculture can Botswana do? Already we have you know, subsidies being offered and youth grants. We have longer payback periods being given to small scale and large scale farmers. And there's already education being offered, which is to promote sustainability. And um, 
please, uh, in your response, address also taking into consideration our water supply issues. Thank you. And the final, final, I'll get a comment from someone in the media. Yes, <laughs> the gentleman at the front whose hand has been up, I apologize for the whole session. Hello, everybody. Go ahead. I'm a Global Shaper also from Tunisia Hub. I have two questions. We heard a lot about South Africa, East Africa, Europe and Western Africa, but not North Africa. Okay. Yeah. We are addressing a lot of things around healthcare systems, education, electricity, uh, also internet penetration, and we think that we have a lot also to exchange with the other parts of the continent. So the, uh, how you think that we can make the cultures and we can talk the same language? And the second point was around uh, investment within the continent. Do you think that uh, the investment can be really, uh, inc can increase if uh, it's not more a problem of finance then a problem of trust and uh, project management. Thank you so much for that. And you know, even uh, looking at the global competitiveness report, you do see that uh, the northern states of, on the continent are doing a lot more in terms of uh, the very areas that he's touched on. Because of time, we literally have just about 10 minutes before we wind up. So I'm going to ask you, we had quite a lot of comments and, and questions. If we, didn't, if we don't manage to comprehensively address them, I apologize. But the issues have been raised in the minds of everybody, which is fantastic. And Praveen, I'm going to start with you on that end. Kindly respond. We had quite a number of issues raised. Um, bilateral agreements, the issue of oil and gas fines in East Africa, which I think I will bring to Benno uh, specifically. Um, political transitions, religious conflicts, uh, tourism should be a focus. In many countries it is. Um, we're also talking here about whether economy drives politics or politics drives the economy. What about health care? Um, that's one of the issues raised. What more can Botswana do? And also with respect to the water issues, keeping that in mind. I think, uh, Lina, I'll bring that to you when I come to you. And then the issue of North Africa. And, and you're all welcome to address any of these issues as we come down. Uh, Pravin, please go ahead. Now, Mr. Draper poses uh, an interesting question, which uh, my colleague from Nigeria and I have long been discussing. So we already have not trade agreements, because that's his speciality, but lots of other agreements, that uh, nine agreements signed between our governments uh, when the president of Nigeria came on an official visit earlier in, in the week. And uh, in the finance area, we, we have any number of areas that we are trying to cooperate in terms of financial services, uh, job creation and, and other forms of innovative areas that we can share knowledge on. In terms of trade, our ministers of trade are discussing how uh, South Africa's experience in terms of the uh, car industry can be transferred to Nigeria and the car industry be developed there. And, and certainly, uh, I'm, I'm sure, it, it's, uh, exploring a free trade uh, agreement is something that they will begin to, to look at and it's a useful uh, idea. But what we are all committed to as far as South Africa and Nigeria is concerned is a term that my colleague uh, lent to me, which I borrow very easily, is complementarity. Mm -hmm. And I think for the next 10 years or so, we should not talk too much about competition. How can we complement each other? Mm -hmm. uh, because that's what's going to enable us to build successful uh, experiments uh, around, around the continent. Sharon, your question about religious and ethnic strife. South Africa is a very good example where we've made some of that transition, but some will take many generations to uh, actually take place. And this is certainly one of the soft elements that we need to give attention to. How do you build cohesive nations? How do you create social cohesion uh, amongst ourselves? Because that stability is as important as economic stability or political stability. And even within the continent as a whole, we've got to do a lot of work amongst our citizens in order to build the right levels of understanding and tolerance and goodwill. Because if we don't, we'll be leaving citizens behind while political and economic elites make deals uh, above their heads. And one of the lessons from Europe and elsewhere is take citizens with us when we make changes uh, in the economic field. Don't tell them one story and then do another thing at the negotiating table, because then you run into uh, all sorts of difficulties. And, and uh, the ideas around tourism and health, I think, are excellent ideas. Mm -hmm. There's a bit of health tourism in South Africa that takes place mm -hmm. uh, from, from Europe. Uh, but there's a lot more that we could do. And I think the point around tourism is an excellent one that we should have mentioned. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lena. 
Yes, let me start with the question that was directed at me because it is a challenge for Botswana. Um, obviously, you are mentioning two things that don't thrive in a, an environment of a desert. As you know, our country is three-quarter desert, so we will struggle with agriculture and we will struggle with water. But some significant inroads have already been made. Um, but before I mention significant inroads, let me just also indicate that um, I wanted to mention earlier when I said I'm excited about um, agriculture, that although that we, we, African countries should um, make sure that they develop agriculture for food security, we should know that food security does not necessarily translate into self-sufficiency. Also, not all countries in Africa can be breadbaskets. So this trade issue that we've been talking about mm. has to facilitate uh, trade amongst countries so that those who are, have the capability and the ability and they've got the geography and weather conditions that enable them to thrive in agriculture should be able to support the other and the other countries will do the same. With respect to agriculture, you know fully well that there are areas of Botswana which have been uh, designated areas that can be able to fulfill the national requirements of um, agricultural goods. But Namadenge is a case in point. So for me, I think I, I'm not too depressed because I'm also keeping at the back of my mind the general uh, um, uh, weather conditions in Botswana. The same situation um, um, uh, can, can be extended to water. Uh, we don't have, in fact, I'm surprised you didn't mention power uh, because that's one of the major deficits. Water is a little bit better. But with respect to water, you know the government is investing tremendously in irrigation of, 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 of dams, constructing them from the beginning, and those that already exist, they, 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 they are making um, a huge investment in ensuring that there's water supply. If the heavens don't open us and we don't get rain because we are in desert conditions, there's very little we can do, but we have to do um, irrigation and construction of dams and do more of it in order to be able to supply water throughout the country, not just in Hebron. Thank you, Lena. Let uh, me just add, with, your, please, briefly. Yes, with respect you. to in, investing in health, I would have thought that um, since the ambulances would only be taking people from their homestead to the airport, if you flew them to Johannesburg, it would take much less time. And <laughs> I can assure you that um, those of us who happen to live closer to South Africa literally walk to the nearest health center in order to get the best health care mm. that you can get. By the way, when I say the best, I'm comparing with the best in the world. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Borg, please. Well, let me make two reflections. First of all, political transitions <laughs> and long-term growth, um, how can we reach that? Well, I think social cohesion is extremely important then. Uh, political transition where people can accept that they lose an election, political transition in terms that they could have long-term sustainable growth, that is about everybody becoming stakeholders in the society. So there, the social cohesion is very, very important. And smart, cohesive policies based on education, provision of health care and other things uh, for, of good quality for low costs, uh, particularly I think education and child care is extremely important. Uh, because if everybody is feeling that they are stakeholders and you're, you're building a kind of an African version of the welfare state, you will have a lot less much more trust in society, and trust is reducing transaction costs in the economy. So it's also a, a, a basically, I think, a, a, a good economic policy. When it comes to tourism, I strongly agree with that. Um, what Africa needs is not one or two kings coming and shooting themselves in the foot. Uh, they actually, what Africa needs is broad-based, ordinary peoples that today go to Thailand who come here for their vacation. Uh, maybe one or two million people every year from Germany, Sweden and other countries coming here for broad-based tourism, because that's the kind of tourism that creates a lot of jobs. And you need jobs to have the social cohesion. So Africa is extremely nice as a tourist country, uh, with a tourist uh, continent, but I, I think the real development uh, can happen when it becomes more ordinary blue-collar and white-collar workers in Europe going here instead of going to Grand Canaria or to, to, to Thailand. And they should continue to go to Thailand too because it's also a very nice country. But, I, I think but, also maybe we, we haven't been able to discuss the issue of, of the protection and preservation of our natural resources. And when it comes to our wildlife, for instance, and, and our environments, our ecosystems, we haven't been able to discuss that. But I guess that is interlinked with the whole idea of, of building a thriving tourist 
uh, industry as well. Uh, thank you, Benno. I'll come to you. We literally have three minutes left, so I'm, I'm trying to rush it along. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I apologize, Bork, if you wanted to come in with more. Benno, the issue of the oil and gas fines in East Africa and how it affects uh, a, a common currency. Well, the, the short of it is that uh, the prospect of becoming rich for any of our partners has not changed our resolve and process of moving towards a common currency. <laughs> the challenges remain the same uh, as we did, uh, faced them before. We are learning from Europe, so we are not rushing into anything. Uh, and essentially, we are also working together in uh, trying to develop a revenue management uh, framework uh, so that we uh, can together uh, you know do and make good use uh, of uh, revenues from oil and gas so it's it's not having any any impact in terms of our our proceeding towards common currency Thank you so much, Ngozi. Let me come to you. Uh, there was the bilateral agreements issue, but also so much more. Please, you have the final word. <laughs> well, I have one minute, so I'll leave the bilateral since Pravin has commented. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just say quickly, the important issue of whether economics drives politics or politics drives uh, economics. Uh, technically, in many places, you should see economics driving politics. Um, and, and, you know, if you can provide people a comfortable standard of living, make sure you, people are employed uh, gainfully and are contributing to society, then you know that those who can do that should presumably be the ones to be elected. But sometimes politics drives economics on the continent. I don't think we're quite there yet, where people link the fact that, you know, as they say, the economy is stupid most of the time. So I think you're going to see both ways, where economics will sometimes drive politics, but also where politics may change the configuration of economics. And that's where we need to build institutions and systems in our countries, so that it doesn't really matter who comes to power, but whatever happens, the country keeps running, like Switzerland. Who knows the president of Switzerland? Does anybody know? How many? <laughs> yeah, you know, but the country keeps working. Finally, just on North Africa, I feel, <laughs> I feel we should respond to the young global Sherpa who made a point. Yes, I think we need to build trust. We are not as familiar you know, with each other, but I think it's also the absence of links. We do not have good transport links, uh, good, good links with North Africa. And we are beginning to have like uh, um, Royal Air Morocco and, and others coming to our countries. If we could build more links and get more people-to-people -people exchanges, and our governments could also work on some of the regional infrastructure, I think uh, that would probably help a lot. And finally, finally, the health care. I couldn't agree more with the lady. I'm very proud of what she said. When are we going to change so that we can provide health care for ourselves and even receive as South Africa is beginning to do? In my country, we have too many people going out uh, for health care, but we are... I just wanted her to know that as a conscious policy, the government is now encouraging the private sector and working with three or four projects where our doctors in the diaspora want to come and build healthcare systems and we're trying to link them up with investors who will also work with them. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much. Let's give our panel a big hand, please. I think. One simple thing we can take away from Pravin, I think it was, complementarity rather than competition could push Africa forward. And I'm just going to take a tweet as well uh, from Ideonomics MEA, WEF Africa Outlook, women hold the key to developing Africa. What should be done in countries to help gender equality? And we can go away thinking about the role uh, that women and I suppose the youth play on this continent and how we're going to spur their growth and, and therefore Africa's growth. Thank you so much for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your uh, final session. Thank you.